I literally came there broken. A home for the homeless. The unique outreach to our invisible problem. It is dawned on me. So it's a question of dignity. Plus, the man who wrote the book on parenting several times. Kevin Lehman shares the importance of the daddy-daughter bond. And then, a fisherman who couldn't get on the boat. He was in a lot of pain to the point where he was immobile. Hear how he was healed. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. The promises keep flowing out of Washington. Isn't it wonderful? If you like your doctor, you can keep it. If you like your health care, you can keep it. Your health care will not go up in price. It will go down. Uh, we're going to stimulate the economy. It's going to be wonderful, and everybody will live happily ever after. Well, it isn't always true. But anyhow, the president is promising to prevent thousands of heart attacks and asthma episodes. Maybe he has a touch with the divine somehow. He says his new crackdown on carbon gas emissions from power plants will heal Americans. But critics say that's code for a war on coal. They argue his plan will actually hurt Americans by killing jobs and hiking electric bills. Heather Sells has the story. Power plants have already reduced their carbon emissions nearly 13 percent since 2005. But the president's plan will force another 17 percent by the year 2030. This is about protecting our health and it is about protecting our homes. Critics say, however, that the president's plan will kill jobs. They're concerned that many companies that rely on coal as a power source will no longer be able to afford it thanks to the new regulations. Any way you look at it, hundreds of thousands of Americans are going to be out of work. And this is during a time where the economy is very, very weak to start with. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says the new plan will lead to the loss of 224,000 jobs each year for the next 16 years. The annual cost to the U.S. economy, $51 billion. Environmental regulations that are coming into effect will retire 60 percent of today's coal fleet. This Kentucky business buys and sells mining equipment. If power plants aren't using as much coal, the mines won't need as much equipment. And DGI trading may leave Kentucky. It's a real life scenario that if, if mining became that bad on this part of the on this part of the United States, then Absolutely. It could, it could be necessary for us to relocate our business. And because 40 percent of the nation's electricity comes from coal, higher electricity costs are expected, which will hurt consumers as well. Within a five-year period after it goes into effect, in many states you'll have a double-digit increase in electricity prices. The plan serves as the centerpiece of the president's efforts to deal with climate change, but its future is uncertain must survive legal and other challenges, and scrapping it could be possible if Republicans take the Senate in November. Heather Sell, CBN News. What do they say? The inmates have taken over the asylum. It's just unbelievable. I mean, there, there seems to be no relationship to actual on-ground activity. Uh, these are zealots. They're highly motivated zealots, and uh, they worship the environment, they worship climate, and I, I don't want to breathe nasty air. I'm sure you don't either, and we want to do everything we can to contain those uh, emissions. I was in Beijing, um, uh, I guess it was around Easter time, as I recall, and the, 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 the smog was so bad you could hardly breathe and you could hardly see where you were going. It was just awful. Just well, there are pockets like that, yeah. especially where they're tucked like in a valley or a mountain mm -hmm. on one side of a mountain range that you really see the impact of it. But on the other hand, 40 percent of our electric production well, comes from coal. I mean, it's going to cripple our economy. It's if they don't care. You know, it's if they don't care about jobs, they don't care about the, the economic engine that makes this country uh, prosperous. You, you just don't understand. It. Well, maybe there'll be an election, maybe there'll be a change, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Well, another potentially harmful example of our big government engineering uh, in our lives is now brewing in Seattle. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. 
That's right, Pat. Seattle is raising its minimum wage to $15 an hour, the highest in the country. City activists celebrated what they consider the beginning of a national movement to close the gap between the rich and the poor. The wage increase begins next April and will be phased in over several years. Small business owners say they'll be passing on the increased cost to customers by raising prices on goods and services. A group of restaurant owners opposed the increase, saying it would limit hiring opportunities and cut worker hours. There's growing fallout over the release of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl in exchange for five Taliban leaders from Guantanamo Bay. New details are coming to light about the circumstances involving Bergdahl's capture by Taliban forces in Afghanistan five years ago. The U.S. Army now says it may pursue an investigation after his fellow soldiers say he was only captured after deserting his Army unit. He walked away. He talked to other members of the platoon. Um, then he talked about, I just want to go over those mountains. Meanwhile, critics say the deal violates America's longstanding policy of not negotiating with terrorists. And lawmakers and legal experts have faulted President Obama for not giving Congress 30 days notice of the prisoner exchange as required by law. The president spoke out today saying he has consulted Congress in the past about the case. Pat? Well, the president consulted the president, and the White House consulted the White House, and the White House gave an opinion it was okay, and so the White House reacted to the opinion that the White House had given. A little circular, but that's the way they did it. Um, but it seems like that there were a number of casualties, not just casualties, but, but deaths, from people who were trying to find this man, trying to, quote, free him from captivity, you know, not being able to attend to the job that was given them uh, in their units. It's been a mess. And Susan Rice went on television and once again put her foot in her, squarely in her mouth, saying this man is a military hero. He's no such thing. It looks like he is a deserter. Uh, who held rather strange views about the United States, about the military, and uh, he just didn't like the system. And as a result, people have died because of him. He is not a hero. John? Pat, the U.S. openly welcomed the new unity government of Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, even though his partner is the Hamas terrorist organization. As Chris Mitchell reports, the move drew sharp reactions from Congress and abroad in Israel. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas swore in his unity government on Monday and ended seven years of division between Hamas and Fatah. We call on the international community to immediately recognize the government and continue to support the Palestinian political leadership efforts to enable the government to face all political challenges, especially the Israeli policies Israel expressed its disappointment and threatened sanctions against the Palestinian Authority. Officials here in Jerusalem warned the world community there's a great deal at stake at this time. By recognizing this new government, they're also embracing a terrorist group. Hamas is a ruthless terrorist organization responsible for the murder of countless innocent civilians and an organization that says my country, Israel, should be destroyed. But the State Department said it would judge the new government by its actions. We intend to work with this government, but we'll be watching closely to ensure that it upholds the principles that President Abbas reiterated today. Israeli government advisor Dory Gold says the move is a mistake. The state of Israel is deeply disappointed in the statements made yesterday by the State Department spokesperson to not immediately reject Hamas to not call on Mahmoud Abbas to break away from Hamas is a very big mistake. It also puts the U.S. administration at odds with the U.S. Congress. Republican Senators Marco Rubio and Mark Kirk called on the U.S. to halt and review U.S. aid to the Palestinian Authority, saying U.S. law is clear. The administration's initial reaction to continue aid is outrageous and runs counter to existing law. We call on the Obama administration to enforce the law. U.S. credibility, as well as Israel's security, are at stake. Their call now draws the battle line between the U.S. Congress and the administration. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. 
President Obama is asking Congress to approve a $1 billion boost to U.S. military presence across Europe, saying it's a necessary step to curb Russia's involvement in Ukraine. The president is on a four-day trip to Europe. His announcement comes after Moscow called a United Nations meeting to push for a ceasefire in Ukraine. The U.S. State Department calls Russia hypocritical because it's doing nothing to stop pro-Russian forces. Deadly violence in eastern Ukraine has been escalating the last few days between Ukrainian troops and Russian separatists. Pat? I'm just astounded. Of course, when Obama takes a trip, it is so expensive. You just cannot imagine. I mean, you know, a couple of days in Brussels, it's 10, billion, 10 million euros. So you just never know uh, what he's going to spend money on. He's probably got a shopping trip for his wife or something. But he wants a billion more dollars to beef up American troops in Europe. Well, how about doing something right now to help the Ukrainians? You know, that's where it's needed, and a little bit of supply or a little bit of training or a little bit of whatever would have been gone a long way and still would. Uh, just to redeploy an air wing into that area and just have them stationed there could make a huge difference, but he doesn't want to do any of that. And as a result, the thing simmers, and Putin has... Putin has won. He's got not only the Crimea, he's gotten a tremendous old gas field in the sea adjoining that. Now he's got claim on a huge amount of hydrocarbons that formerly be, belonged to the Ukraine. Here's John. Pat, more than any place in the world, Christians suffer the worst persecution in North Korea. Yet in the heart of Pyongyang, a Christian-backed university is bringing Western education to the country's elite. Gary Lane has more. Graduation ceremonies are common occurrences this time of year at American colleges and universities. But look closely, this is no Ivy League school. These 44 students, all males, receive their diplomas from Pyongyang University of Science and Technology in North Korea. It's a first-time event for the Hermit Kingdom. Never before have science and technology students graduated from a foreign-funded, foreign-staffed university in their country. In 2011, university founder and president James Chin Kyung Kim appeared on the 700 Club shortly after the university opened. We are training the top elite. So now over 300 students we are teaching. And uh, all, you know, this Pyongyang University of the Science and Technology is a very different than any other university in, in the world. Different because North Koreans live in a closed, militaristic, authoritarian society. Rarely are they given access and exposure to foreigners and Western ideas. But here they learn computer engineering, agriculture and life science, and international finance and management. Students are given internet access, and their housing and meals far exceed the quality of other North Korean universities. Their professors are foreigners like this instructor who likened his homework experience to teacher's heaven. Because we give them homework, uh, but we tell them only do five, but they usually do 10. And then on the weekend, maybe sometimes we say, oh, you have too much homework in the other class, so no homework, but they do homework anyway. While the school is backed by evangelical Christians in South Korea and the United States, the university does not promote Christianity. Kim says he's not a communist or a capitalist, he's a loveist who is building bridges of peace on the Korean peninsula. He says before he started the university, he was arrested and accused of being a CIA spy. His North Korean captors forced him to write a will, but he responded with love because he wanted to build bridges of peace on the Korean peninsula. Peace comes with the price. Everyone would like to have peace, mm -hmm. but who must to pay the price? Who going to pay? We, our Christian, yes. God's people, can pay the price. And most of the class of 2014 graduates say they'll either continue their advanced studies in Europe or immediately begin work. Gary Lane, CBN News. 
Pat, do you think this could be the key to eventually opening up the hermit kingdom? Uh, it could be. It's an amazing thing. That, that is one of the most closed societies. But Dr. Kim, what an amazing man. And the fact that I, I don't understand it. I really don't. The only thing I can think of, you're looking at God's miracle. But uh, hey, it's happening. And he was here to tell us about it. Terry? Well, up next, from the land of the Indianapolis 500, another race is on. The race to save teens who are living on the streets after this. When it comes to finding true love. We've got a little surprise for you. All other dating shows don't have a prayer. Your church is about to play matchmaker. Oh my word. Natalie Grant and congregations from coast to coast help one of the faithful find their chosen one. Tall, dark, handsome. Who cries easy. It Takes a Church premieres Thursday at 9, 8 central, only on Game Show Network. Today, get up and walk. Come with me. What are we going to do? Change the world. Experience the power of Son of God. Own it on Blu-ray and digital HD today. Tomorrow, up close and personal with Governor Mike Pence. I pray often that, uh, for a discerning heart. Plus, a wife and mom leads a double life until she gets busted. I was so disgusted with myself. I popped a bottle of Xanax. And I got up the courage and went to my mother and told her, and she wouldn't believe me. Josh McDowell reveals the secret he hid for 50 years on tomorrow's 700 Club. Well, you're watching the 700 Club. Delighted to have you with us. The statistics are staggering. Close to 2 million American teenagers live on the streets. And those under 18 wake up almost, uh, excuse me, make up almost half of the country's homeless population. But as David, David Brody reports, out of the trunk of a car comes a story of hope. From the crossroads of America, Eric Howard found himself at a crossroad with God. God just captured my heart in this hotel room. And I can tell you what I was wearing, the length of my hair, the steam on the mirror, the, the color of the carpet, the tree outside, the bedspread. And from that point on, uh, my life just took a, a very different direction of what I thought was success and what is success were two different things. That moment put Howard on a journey to serve a group many don't even know exist. When you think of Indianapolis, you of course think of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Indy 500. And while they do a lot of racing here, the folks at Outreach Incorporated are doing a different sort of race. They're racing against time to save homeless teenagers. So from that point, uh, uh, bottles of water, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and blankets in the trunk of a car, it's blossomed to where we are now. And where is that exactly? A full-blown ministry helping teenagers living on the streets of Indy. Howard's Outreach, Inc. provides basic and often overlooked necessities. Necessities that Howard says he didn't even consider until a run-in with a frustrated teenager changed his thinking. Hey, I've been doing ministry with the homeless for, you know, 12 years, 14 years. Please tell me what I don't understand. And he goes, I can go out and get a job. And of course, my flesh, I said, then why don't you? Um, probably wasn't the best answer I could have said at that moment. He goes, what you don't understand is I can smell myself. Do you really want me serving up your shake and fries? Uh. And it is dawned on me. So it's a question of dignity. Through the help of donations, Outreach added laundry facilities, showers, job interview courses, outdoor adventures, graduation assistance, and yes, the little things that teens look forward to, like driving lessons, all in an attempt to provide a sense of normalcy and a place to call home. So you walk into a living room, which you're received well, just like you're walking into our house, whatever, you're bringing it to a guest. Mm -hmm. Outreach also incorporated a street initiative team that ventures to parts of the city where others fear to tread. Often at night, they spend hours looking under bridges and overpasses to help those in need. One specific offer appealed to 24-year-old Tiffany Pettiford. What I found at Outreach is what I was looking for, literally for my whole teenage life to become an adult. It's just love. This is a safe place that you can come and feel love, and they have the love of God there, which is really important. Homeless since the age of 21, life started out rough for Tiffany. 
as a young child, I went to 12 different elementary schools. I went to three different um, middle schools and two different high schools. Mm -hmm. So never really had any stability. Then changes at home forced her into a life on the streets. I could very well be dead if I didn't turn my life to Christ. Um, situations like I can remember times where I'll be walking the streets at two, three, four o'clock in the morning in areas I probably shouldn't even be in. Anything could have happened. And something did happen. Tiffany found God's love on the steps of outreach. The first day I went there, I walked to the car three times before I actually went into the building. I'm like, I don't know if I should do this. Da, da, da. I was very hesitant. She found her physical needs met as well as her spiritual needs. I literally came there broken, you know, from my mind frame or how I looked at life and emotionally and physically and really changed me into the woman that I am today. Now that woman is a thriving 24 year old college student with a great job and a new home. She's happy to show off her new life and give credit to God's love and the help of outreach. She also rediscovered a lost relationship. My brother and someone he, who he calls his older brother, um, they were online looking for him. And at the same time that they were looking for him, our dad was looking for us. Me and my dad's relationship, is, it's actually really good. I'm the youngest, so I kind of get spoiled a little bit. Proving that when God writes the story, miracles can even come from the trunk of a car. David Brody, CBN News, from Indianapolis. That's beautiful. You know, a little bit. Can you be the one? Just take one. Just one person can change the world. Just one person. And it's happening in Indianapolis. Well, we've got a good friend coming up, Terry. We sure do. Kevin Lehman is in the house, the popular author of the Birth Order books and the father of four girls. He's going to talk about dads and daughters. There you go. He'll be on right after this. Pat Boone here with a word about bank safety. Do you think your money is safe in the bank? Don't bank on it. A generation ago, bank accounts felt secure and they paid interest. This encouraged the virtue of thrift and saving. But today, bank accounts pay virtually nothing and they've shifted from low risk to high risk. For example, did you know your money deposited in most U.S. banks could be subject to limited withdrawal and even confiscation? Oh, yes. And that's just the first of 19 risks explained in a new white paper entitled Don't Bank on It. You still think your bank deposits are safe? You better get this vital new Don't Bank on It white paper now. Call the number on the screen or visit SwissAmerica.com, the gold standard. Learn how simple it is to become your own banker today. Want to be more involved in your child's education? Since starting online school and being at home, his whole demeanor has changed. No matter what your student needs, an online school program powered by K-12 could be your answer. The K-12 curriculum can work for any child at any level. It's made me more independent, more self-motivated, and it allowed me to succeed beyond what I thought I was capable of. K-12 is individualized to fit any student, including advanced learners and students from kindergarten to college prep. When I want to finish five lessons in one day, I can do it. K-12 has an award-winning curriculum delivered by state-certified teachers. It's a public school option, so it's tuition free, and it's designed to help parents be an active participant. Parents are advocates for their students. They want to do what's best. It's a commitment, and it, it's, it's something that you, know, you have to embrace if you think that that's the best learning environment for them. 94% of K-12 parents say their student has benefited academically. Call or visit k12.com today for your free information kit. Psychologist Kevin Lehman is best known for his birth order books. Now Dr. Lehman has written a new book about the relationship between dads and their daughters. Take a look. The person that matters the most in a girl's life isn't her mother. It's her dad, at least according to Dr. Kevin Lehman. He's an internationally known psychologist and the father of five. Four of them are girls. He believes a girl's life decisions are directly tied to the relationship she has with her father. In his book, Be the Dad She Needs You to Be, Kevin helps every father leave a lasting imprint on his daughter's heart. Now, 
and for a lifetime. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Dr. Kevin Lehman. Welcome, nice to have you here again. Oh, thank you. Well, we mentioned you've got four daughters in your own family, and <laughs> that's a full-time job, isn't it? Oh, yeah, just trying to find your toothbrush in the morning. <laughs> You're, you've got hair scrunchers, curlers, <laughs> eyelid things, things that burn you, put you in the emergency room, just trying to get your tooth, toothbrush going. <laughs> Usually some of that's in your toothbrush, right? Yeah, oh, they're different. You women are... We are at work... <laughs> Weird. We're going to wonder. Talk a little bit about why dads are so significant in the lives of their daughters. Well, every bit, of, every bit of research says this. If a dad is engaged in his daughter's life, he sets her off on a positive trajectory mm. in life. Take the dad out of the home, all kind of bad things happen. So talk about that a little bit, because there are plenty of homes today, we hear about it all the time, where the dad isn't in the home. How do you remedy that? Well, if you're a single mom, number one, you can't be dad, okay? Yeah. Just be mom. Be as consistent as you can. Don't let guilt, especially for women, mm -hmm. guilt is the propellant for most of the lousy decisions you're going to make, Terry, as a single mom. So your daughter needs discipline, okay? And yes, maybe there's a grandfather and uncle that serves as a surrogate dad. Strong male figure. But I'll tell you, it's like making a cake. You leave out sugar in the cake, I got news for you, it's not going to yeah. be a good cake. Yeah. So the problem is that women who don't have a positive dad in their life are drawn toward people that aren't good for them. Mm -hmm. There's your problem. Yeah, and you see it all the time. You talk a little bit about the role of the father. Well, you talk a great deal about it in the, the book, Be the Dad She Needs You to Be. But the dad being the authoritarian figure in most families and the mom more the emotional feeding figure. but. But talk about the three principles that you share that are so good for dads to utilize. Hey, you go and do what I tell you to do. You understand me? <laughs> Don't make me come over there. You want something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. There's your authoritarian, yeah. okay? The permissive. Uh, Brittany, honey, it's 8 o'clock. Have you chosen to go to bed yet? Mm -hmm. Okay? There's yeah. your permissive, okay? Snow plows the roads of life for the kid. The only one that's reflective of God's teaching is the authoritative parent. Authoritative, not authoritarian. Not authoritarian. Right? And, mm -hmm. and it says, you know, God didn't put you on this earth to be run over by your daughter. Yeah. You know, so when she rolls her eyes, and she will, mm -hmm. uh, what do most parents say? Hey, don't you be rolling your eyes in this house. I'm telling you right. You know, Dad, lighten up. Lighten yeah. up. Say, honey, oh, oh, that was good. Do that again. Honey. Do it in slow motion, would you please? <laughs> and so if you're, if you're talking to your daughter, talk yeah. with her. If you're driving her to school this morning, don't ask her questions. Yeah. Don't ask her questions. Say, Lehman, if I did yeah. that, she wouldn't say a word. Sooner or later, she will. Say to your daughter, honey, what's your opinion about this? Hey, does this match this? Can I wear this? Yeah. Dad, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. So, in other words, if you don't go there, she's going to become a slamming clicker, which means she goes to her bedroom, she slams the door, she clicks it, and then she texts her friends mm -hmm. like a woodpecker that's got ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> She'll shut you out of your life. Yeah. You have to build the relationship, don't you? Yeah, she doesn't care what you know until she knows you care. Yeah. yeah. And you women, you love affection. You like words. You like sentences, paragraphs, mm -hmm. complete thoughts. Share that with your daughter. Yeah. And, you know, I, as I read the book, of course, you're writing this to dads, but I, I got a lot out of it as a mom as well. You talk about looking at our children and from a dad's perspective, because his opinion means so much to a daughter with a critical eye. We don't mean to be critical when we do that. We're trying to help, but it, they don't receive it that way. The critical eye will turn a typical firstborn daughter who tends to be perfectionistic, mm -hmm. likes her little ducks in the row, uh, into a procrastinator. Yeah. one who will never fulfill her uh, ambitions in life. What makes you a good architect or an engineer, the perfection that you have in your work is the same stuff that works against you with those you love, with your wife. Hey, honey, what's with the carrots? Yeah. You might be wearing carrots shortly. Be careful what you say. <laughs> so the critical eye is that perfectionistic, flaw-picking dad. Mm -hmm. You need to be affirming. Boy, that, sometimes that's really a, a difficult scenario. I want you to share, um, because even when, when dads get to be, or when j daughters get to be grown-ups, dads can still impact them. You have a story of a family member oh. that was hospitalized, oh. and his daughter could tell, oh, you gosh. tell it. <laughs> oh, well, this cousin was 20 years older than me, so we were very close. We grew up two streets away. And my cousin, Carol, who lives in North Carolina, sent me this email, and I put it in the end of the book, just the top the book off and she says, Kevin, it was great to talk to you. It really warms my heart to hear about all your kids. Don't know if I ever 
if I ever, if you know this or not, but my dad was in a home for the last few years. Bob and the boys and I would go and visit him every week. His tiny room was filled with pictures the boys would draw of their papa. My dad had no idea who we were at that age, in, in, at that stage in his life. Anyway, every time we would go to leave, he'd cry and ask us to take him with us. He even said he didn't know us, but we seemed like really nice people. <laughs> It would break my heart to leave him. The day after Easter, I went to see him without Bob and the boys. I took him a big chocolate bunny sucker and chocolate shake, two of his favorites. And as I walked in the room, there he sat in some other person's clothing. That was typical with his Velcro sneakers on the wrong feet. <laughs> I sat beside him and gave him his treats. He lit up like a four-year-old sitting on Santa's lap. I told him what the boys were up to, even though he had no clue who the boys were. When he finished his treats, there was chocolate all over his face. As I was cleaning his face, he looked up at me. He said, all of a sudden, he said, you can go now. I'm fine. I laughed and said, I'm not going anywhere. He said it again, but this time, it was like he almost knew what he was saying. And this took me by surprise because he always cried when I left him. I told him, okay. Gave him a hug and kiss and told him I loved him. As I walked out of the door to leave, my dad said to me, boy, I never thought I'd be treated this good today. I smiled and told him I'd see him in a few days and left. Ten minutes after I left, he died of a heart attack. Mm. I was the one they called. I'm positive he knew he was going to die and didn't want me to be there. My daddy even protected me to the end. I love that man. And so dads want to protect. Yeah. That's yeah. who we and have are. And the power to protect. Yes. In their words, and their actions. So it, when you enter that daughter's life, gentlemen, you make a huge difference. Yeah. By just affirming her femininity. Mm -hmm. And when she's growing up before your very eyes, our tendency is to say what? Uh, uh, Terry, maybe you ought to have a talk with a daughter there. She's beginning to, you know, sort of fill out there on top. Well, I'm here to tell you, if anybody should talk with a daughter about life, it's sex, relationship, daddy. it's dad. Yeah. It's and job. mom to son. Those are the key relationships, father and daughter and mother and son. Yeah. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but it's such important information because you and I as parents have the power to make a huge difference in the lives of our children. Be the dad she needs you to be. Father's Day is coming up in a couple of weeks. Kevin's book would be a great gift for dad, and it's available wherever books are sold around the country. Thank you so much. It's always a treat to have you here. And much better than uh, soap on the rope and a weed whacker. Yeah. <laughs> Probably got several of those. <laughs> well, still Thanks, ahead. Mary. We're going to be praying for you and for your needs. But first, a wife takes drastic action to help her husband with his back pain. She took the channel changer away from me. <laughs> and you guys know what that means when the man doesn't have the channel changer. <laughs> and she put the tape in. You'll see how that tape led to this man's instant healing. That's coming up. I was having some pains between my shoulder blades. At that point, everything changed. Diagnosis, pancreatic cancer. First there was prayer. The second is to fight. As soon as we walked through those doors at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, all my anxiety left. The pastoral care here is based on the Bible, based on the Word of God, just as it is at our own church. When you combine the great medicine with the spiritual resources we have, it provides the patients with something that really can make a difference. You got a pastor right there on staff praying with patients, whether it be scripture or whether it just be a word of encouragement to say God's got this. If you or someone you love is fighting complex or advanced stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. You'll learn how our treatment results compare to national averages and see a list of insurance plans with which we've worked. Advanced medicine and technology, the warm embrace of the spirit. I firmly believe God led me here. Call or go to cancercenter.com. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Appointments available now. What can you get when you visit Vonage Online for home phone service? Unlimited nationwide calling for $9.99 a month for a full six months. You betcha. How about calling from both your home and mobile phone? Sure, pal. What about getting our best offer ever? Certainly, y'all. Visit Vonage Online or call today. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The husband of the Christian woman sentenced to death for apostasy in Sudan 
is an American citizen. The State Department is confirming for the first time that Daniel Wani is an American. But officials can't confirm the children are Americans without genetic testing. Miriam Ibrahim gave birth to her second child in the prison where she's being held. Her first child is also in prison with her. Meanwhile, Sudan's foreign ministry is denying rumors that Miriam is going to be released. Well, judging a hurricane by its gender could put you at risk. A study by the National Academy of Sciences finds people are more likely to flee a hurricane with a masculine name than one with a feminine name. For instance, a hurricane named Victor gets taken more seriously than a storm named Victoria. But that doesn't mean feminine named hurricanes are any less dangerous. In fact, the two deadliest storms since 1979 were named Katrina and Sandy. Still, over 1,000 test subjects told scientists they were more afraid of male name storms than female ones. That's funny to me. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Even though Instaflex is now the number one selling joint supplement at GNC, there are still too many people suffering with joint discomfort who haven't experienced the Instaflex difference. So now the makers of Instaflex are on a mission to give out as many complimentary two-week samples of Instaflex as we can in the next 24 hours. These complimentary samples are not available in stores. And to guarantee your sample, you must call now, 1-800-963-0946. Instaflex is number one at GNC because it's our most powerful joint relief formula ever. In a clinical study at a major university, Instaflex was shown to significantly reduce joint discomfort. Experience the difference now with your complimentary sample. Instaflex is available at GNC, Walgreens, and these fine retailers, but you can only get your complimentary two-week sample by calling 1-800-963-0946. We want to give out as many complimentary Instaflex samples as we can in the next 24 hours, so call and guarantee yours now. 1-800-963-0946. Tomorrow, up close and personal with Governor Mike Pence. I pray often that uh, for a discerning heart. Plus... A wife and mom leads a double life until she gets busted. I was so disgusted with myself. I popped a bottle of Xanax. And I got up the courage and went to my mother and told her, and she wouldn't believe me. Josh McDowell reveals the secret he hid for 50 years on tomorrow's 700 Club. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Well, you're watching the 700 Club. The time is coming for you to have an answer to prayer. We're going to be praying for you. But first, I want to introduce you to Stoyan Yankov. He's a fisherman whose wife once described him as, quote, big, tough, and ornery. But when Stoyan developed excruciating back pain, he was forced to spend days confined to his recliner. That's when his wife got a brilliant idea. She took the remote control away from him and played a tape on his TV set. Stoyan Yankov is a man of the sea, a proud fisherman for over 40 years. His story begins in his homeland of communist Bulgaria. When I was a kid, my dad started taking me fishing. And we, he took me fishing one Sunday, and that's when it all started. It, we caught more fish than anyone else around us and I was on fire for fishing. Later on, we, I found out that I grew up and I was, uh, I finished eighth grade and was getting ready to go to middle school to learn a uh, trade. I noticed that the only people that can leave the country are the fishermen. They, they are the only ones that could leave the country. So that's, I, I wanted to go to a fishing school and that's what I did in 1972. Stoyan went to a military-sponsored fishing school. He learned his craft well, but he was also taught something else. You're in an environment where you're constantly brainwashed to believe in that system of communism, socialism, and atheism, and evolution. You have to understand that there is no personal freedoms in communism and socialism. Everything is controlled by the government, and you did whatever the government told you to. He completed the four-year program, and Stoyan's first assignment was aboard the first Bulgarian vessel to trawl off the northwest coast of the United States. But Stoyan had other plans. Everyone's dream 
at that time was to defect and live in the United States in a country so powerful and so advanced. We all knew how advanced the United States was, but we don't know how, how much. While their boat was docked in Portland, Stoyan and two other crewmen left the boat. A guard stopped them on the gangplank. His job was to make sure no one, no one came in on the vessel or left. But once every hour, he has to go around the ship and check everything. So he said, where are you guys going? I said, well, we're, we're defecting. He said, no, you're not. I said, why not? Well, you know, basically the gentleman didn't want to be a witness. So he said, well, every hour I have to go around the ship. So when they disappear out of view, just, you know, <laughs> go ahead and leave. It was that simple. Stoyan was free. He got a job right away as a crewman on a local trawler. As the years went by, he worked his way up to part owner of a trawler, making routine trips to Alaska. He soon met Angelique, and they married in 1986. She was a Christian, but Stoyan wasn't. He was this big, tough, kind of ornery Alaska fisherman. Get out of my way, I'm coming through, and I don't care. My wife had tried to talk to me about God and Jesus, but I rejected it because of my background and, uh, and uh, striving to be the best at what I was doing. He would get really angry when I'd mention God or try to talk about God, and so after a while, I just stopped. Decades of hard work took their toll on Stoyan, and he developed excruciating sciatica in his back and leg. And he was in a lot of pain, and it had increased to the point where um, he was immobile. And, and Stoyan had been in this recliner, sleeping and laying, sitting for at least a week and a half. As the pain got worse, Stoyan watched more television. One day, Angelique had an idea. She took the channel changer away from me. <laughs> and you guys know what that means when the man doesn't have the channel changer. <laughs> and she put the tape in. My mother had sent us this video. And of course, it was these incredible stories of miracles, healings, and people being saved. At the end of the tape, when Pat Robertson started talking about this man that is sitting on a chair with excruciating pain. His sciatic condition is being healed by the power of God. He was basically describing me exactly down to the last detail. It was me, and that's what got my attention. And then at the end, when he said, uh, uh, in the name of Jesus, you are healed, get up and walk, it really got my attention. And so I looked at him and I said, what are you waiting for, you know, stand up. And he stood up. When I got up off the chair and I started walking around and I was shaking my leg and there was no pain, there was zero pain. I knew right then there was a God. And uh, I started believing the, in the God right then and right there. When you feel the power of God coming over you, <laughs> it's like no other feeling. <laughs> You know God is there. Ever since that day, my back has been pain-free. There is no pain. Stoyan became a Christian that day. He and Angelique joined a church and were baptized together. That was a key turning point in our lives, that healing, because we both experienced that at the exact same moment. God began to work and move in our lives from, from that point, and he kept he kept on like this. Stoyan's journey as a fisherman started over 40 years ago, and he's still going strong today. He has his own boat and crew and continues to fish in Alaska when he's not working from his home office. If someone that was born and raised in a communist country and being brainwashed in evolution theory, which has no legs to stand on, if someone like that can come to this country and be saved, and become a believer in God and a follower of Jesus, then there's hope for everyone else because I rejected God all my life until God, God got a hold of me and told me that he can do all the kinds of things for me. All I have to do is ask him. And that's all it takes for you to ask God and he will come into your heart and it will change your life and you will never be the same.
you'll change your life, you'll never be the same. Ladies and gentlemen, I was just talking to Terry as we were watching this. That man was watching a tape, a tape of a program that took place previously, I don't know wh when, but it described precisely what he had, and God knew in advance, had it all planned. Think of the wisdom of God, and think of the power of God. And a God like that, it's nothing to heal somebody's sciatica. That's nothing. But in a sense, for this man, it was everything. It was his introduced to the Lord. All right, here, we want to pray for you. But here's somebody, Antoinette, uh, who lived in Eureka, Montana, had a sore throat. Pain was so intense she could uh, not drink juice or even eat tomatoes. She saw several doctors prescribed aspirin but, uh, and nose pains, and one doctor diagnosed her with an infection in her sinuses. She was watching this program last April. She heard Terry gave a word. There's someone, you've got a chronic, it's almost like a low-grade infection, chronic sore throat, swollen glands, won't go away. God's healing your immune system. And guess what? Antoinette was healed. She hadn't had any pain since. What mm. else you got? This is Grace. She lives in White River, South Dakota. She started having problems with her left foot in December of 2012. It was swollen and painful. X-rays showed she had a deformity with the bone in the arch of her foot, and one tiny portion of that had even broken off. So she wrapped her foot with bandages, even used ankle braces. It still hurt just to walk. Her doctor recommended cortisone shots. She was reluctant to depend on medication. Then last April, she was watching this Program. And Pat, she heard you give a word of knowledge. You said there's a bone that's out of place and it really hurts every time you step on it. Those bones are going to move into place and you will be completely pain free. When Grace attempted to flex her foot, she could feel it, quote, loosen up. A short while later, it popped and she felt no more pain, completely healed. Praise God. God knows you. Amen. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to join hands together right now, and we're going to believe God. Father, Jesus. in Jesus' precious name, we mm -hmm. come before you thanking you for all you're doing. God, you're right. A cracked mm -hmm. tibia is being healed right now as we speak. Terry, you've got something. Mm -hmm. There's someone, you have like pockets of infection in the back of your throat, and um, you can, you'll know this is you because it drains actually. You get that funny taste that infection has in your throat. God is totally healing that for you. It'll be gone. A neck pain, again, is a dislocation in your vertebra. And uh, if you put your hand on the back of your neck, the Lord is going to put it in place. In the name of Jesus, you are healed. Somebody else, you have really strong heart palpitations. It frightens you sometimes, especially when you lay down. It's, it almost feels like your heart's going to pound out of your chest. God is regulating your rhythm of your heartbeat, and it's going to be fine. Touch lives now, Lord. You, heal the sick. Minister. And do a miracle in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wherever you are, let us hear from you. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for your uh, calls. And mm -hmm. if you need help, 1 800 759 0700. Well, up next, we've got your email questions. Mary Ann says, I have to teach first through third graders the concept of holiness in Sunday school. It got me thinking. What is holiness, really? We'll answer Mary Ann's question and more. We're going to bring it on when we come back. Well, first I developed an earache. I believe it was coming back from El Salvador. And I had this earache for probably about a month. I wasn't sure what was going on. I get all the different noises, pain, but nothing like this. Pat and Terry are praying. Swelling's going to go down, the infection will leave, and you'll be able to hear completely well. So, and it went, it went away, and that was, that was that. And I knew I was healed. And I'm so grateful. And thick or thin, he's always, he's always there. And if you let him work, just give him a chance. He'll never look back. When it comes to finding true love... We've got a little surprise for you. All other dating shows don't have a prayer. Your church is about to play matchmaker. Oh, my word. Natalie Grant and congregations from coast to coast help one of the faithful find their chosen one. Tall, dark, handsome. He cries easy. It's posting it. It Takes a Church premieres Thursday at 9, 8 central, only on Game Show Network.
Well, we love to get your email questions, but we also love to just hear from you. I have a couple of viewer comments, Pat. Yeah. I thought I'd share these with you. I think these are kind of fun. This is Steve who wrote and said, I'm 59 years old. I'm an old hippie surfer dude that got saved over 35 years ago in an old backwoods Pentecostal church. I never miss the 700 Club. You never cease to bless me. Personally, I think that you are the coolest, most laid back dude in the world. Uh, Steve, I love it. <laughs> Okay, this one's from Beth. Best says, compliment I've heard in the year. <laughs> Beth says, a few months ago, I was in a really dark place. I was planning my suicide. At the same time, I'd also been praying to God to change my circumstances in my life. Nothing in my circumstances was changing, but I just couldn't go through with my plans. I started watching the 700 Club regularly and reading my Bible. Slowly, things began to change. My mood lifted, and I started to have a glimmer of hope. It's been about five months, and my mood has done a complete 180 degree change and I'm no longer on antidepressants. Praise the Lord. I now have such an intimate, joyful relationship with God that I could never have imagined before. Doesn't that bless you? Well, we're here. We're laid back, uh, cool, <laughs> and joyful. And loving God. Oh, loving yeah. God and having a good time. All right, some questions. Okay, here's some bring it on questions for you. This is Marianne who wrote and said, I have to teach first through third graders the concept of holiness in Sunday school. I know it's not the way you wear your hair or a certain type of clothing, even though holiness should influence everything about you. But it got me thinking, what is holiness really? You think you know what it means until you have to explain it to someone else, especially children. Well, you're going to ask those children, what do you think God is like? And Jesus said, be ye holy even as your heavenly Father is holy. And, and I think the idea is it's being like God. And being, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, somebody was, you know, uh, given over to God. They were, they, they were, the idea was they were consumed in a fire. But their being has changed to become like God. That's what it is. I mean, that's what holiness ultimately is, is to be like God. So you might ask those little kids, what do you think God's like? Mm -hmm. Is he good? Is he kind? Is he loving? That's what he wants you to be. And I was just reading about this in my devotions yesterday, uh -huh. that we get that from being with him, not just thinking about him, but he, being with him, which good. a child could really understand, sure. do you think? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, this is Tina Pat, who says, Dear Pat, I recently rededicated my life to Christ. I had been backslidden for six years prior to this. I feel that I'm still in a state of confusion and desperation about everything. I've prayed for direction and guidance. When I pray, I feel that my prayers go no higher than the ceiling. I try to focus on all the good things God has blessed me with. When I try to do this, suddenly I think about my awful faults and mistakes I've made in the past. I hate myself and feel like a piece of dirt. When I go to my Bible for study, I just can't understand or apply the teachings in my life. I want to be a strong Christian for Jesus, but there seems to be something in the way. All Any right. advice? Yes, uh, your sins have separated you from God, and the heavens are like brass. What you need to do is to get off by yourself with a Bible and with a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, and I want you to pray, and then the Lord will show something to you. You know, I cursed God. Write it down. I committed adultery. I committed fornication. Write it down. I was drunk or I was taking drugs, write it down. You know, I insulted my mother and father, write it down. And when you get through everything that comes to your mind, you say, God, I did every one of these things. I ask for your forgiveness and I receive your forgiveness. And then take that piece of paper, take a match and put it on fire and burn it up. And from that moment on, receive the forgiveness that God's given you and begin to thank him and praise him. And from that moment on, walk free because he does not want you being beat up. He wants you to have a clear conscience that he might, that you might serve the living God. He wants your service, not your humiliation. All right. Okay, this is Dana who says, I was watching NASCAR Sunday and they mentioned race driver Tony Stewart and how he's not 100% after having surgery on a leg, but you'd never know it. Have you ever been bucked off a horse and not gotten hurt and gotten back up and just kept going? Well, I had a crazy thoroughbred, and uh, there was I was coming out of a ditch, and uh, I wanted to go right, and he wanted to go left. <laughs> and he's a great big horse, and I'm, I'm you know, and he he goes, he sweet, and I went off uh, onto the pavement, which oh, was a little gosh. painful. 
And the answer was, yes, I got up and got back on him. And that's the way you really have to do. So have I ever done it? That that was one time. I'm sure there have been others. But you just have to do it. I mean, yes. you know, you, you get back on. Especially as a kid, you, you, they, they fall off or something. But, uh, you know, right now, I'm, hey, by the way, on Thursday, we're going to have a dressage exhibition with yours truly on tape. Uh, yeah, and you went out yesterday and rode. You have a big horse. Big, bigger than that thoroughbred. <laughs> he's a huge. I mean, he's he's a seventeen three hands. Great big thing, wonderful horse. But you know, it's funny. I talked to somebody who knows nothing about riding, and invariably they say, "Aren't you afraid you'll fall off?" That's the last thing that comes to your mind when you when you what you want to do is to get the horse doing good movements and doing certain things, and and you're thinking about the procedures and, yeah. and the tests. You're not just riding. I mean, you perform with him. Oh, when absolutely. You're on him. He's a he's a he's a grand prix dressage horse. I mean, as in Olympic style. He's a mm -hmm. great horse. All right. What okay. Else? This is Patricia who says, our teenage grandson called his mom vile names and put his fist up to her face and has never apologized. He's broken off contact with his mom. What role should the aunts and uncles have in this teenager's life? Should the aunts and uncles initiate contact with this teenager without consulting his mom first? Well, if he had a father <laughs> and I was the father, I must say that kid would never do that again as long as he lived. <laughs> He, 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 there wouldn't be any fooling around. It would never happen. But I think he needs a, an intervention. What if, if he doesn't have a father, you need to get together and get that kid in there. If he keeps that up, he's going to prison. He will wind up in prison for a long time. He's going to kill somebody. He's going to rob a store. He's going to do something. And uh, his life will be totally ruined. And if you love him, have an intervention. And that's what uncles and aunts can do and tell the mother, we want to help you. All right. Yes. Okay, Pat, this is Jim who says, what in the United States Constitution allows the Supreme Court to accept cases that deal with subjects over which the legislative branch is prohibited from making laws? I refer to the activism of the court in dealing with religious issues. Their rulings have the effect of laws. Um, I wrote a book called Courting Disaster. It has about 172 uh, Supreme Court uh, references, mm -hmm. cases. I analyze these things thoroughly. There's no way under heaven I can do it in this short length of time. The Supreme Court has taken unto itself power that was never intended for it to have in the Constitution. But we have exceeded, accepted that. And over the years, the Supreme Court has now become the dominant branch. The legislature is supposed to be the dominant branch under the Constitution. That's what Jefferson said, and I agree with him. Uh, the Supreme Court wasn't. So where in the Constitution does it say it? Well, it, it, it doesn't. But there's a case called Marbury versus Madison, where Chief Judge John Marshall uh, gave the courts the power to nullify laws. And it was one of those things that didn't have a big impact. But all of a sudden, it is laid there, and it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So. If you want to get a book, read it. Uh, it's called Courting Disaster. I guess it's, it's, it's not, a, they're not selling it anywhere, but you can probably get it in a library or maybe at Amazon. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Thanks for being with us. Tomorrow we've got Mike Pence, governor of Indiana, talks about his journey from the cornfields to the governor's mansion. And we've got a lot of things going on. If you need help, we're here. The counselors are here 24 hours a day. But for Terry and Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, up close and personal with Governor Mike Pence. I pray often that, uh, for a discerning heart. Plus, a wife and mom leads a double life until she gets busted. I was so disgusted with myself. I popped a bottle of Xanax. And I got up the courage and went to my mother and told her, and she wouldn't believe me. Josh McDowell reveals the secret he hid for 50 years on tomorrow's 700 Club. My sister was born with a cleft lip and palate. She coughed and choked when I tried to feed her. So she was malnourished. I was sure this would affect the development of her brain. The Ma's knew Shaoling's lip would only get worse. And no one they asked could help. 
Then they heard about CBN, and we arranged for free surgery. I saw my mom smile for the first time in a long time. Xiaoling is like a princess. These are the things you make possible when you partner with CBN. Thousands of people around the world begin new lives because you cared enough to give. To those of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club, thank you. Your help will make a tremendous difference in so many lives. Be sure to watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. Because when we all come together to help, miracles happen.